Good morning, good afternoon, good day, everyone. And thank you very much for joining. Welcome to the fifth Local Climate Solutions for Africa Congress, LOX 2020. My name is Nachi Madre from Italy, Africa. We would like to welcome you to our capacity building hub called Cool Buildings for Cities in Hot Climates, Financing Energy Efficiency for economy, climate, and comfort. As a start, I will be taking you through to, um, in terms of how to use the platform. But I'd also like to first acknowledge um, that this session and the LOX Congress is held by Italy Africa together with our partners, the government of Rwanda, as well as the city of Kigali. Now, moving on to how to use the platform. This session has a live interpretation and we invite you to listen in your language of choice. And the languages um, can be seen at the bottom of your screen where you're able to choose um, which language you'd prefer to listen to the session. And you can, you can see this at the bottom of your screen. The languages offered are French, English, as well as Portuguese. You also have the option to mute the original audio if the speaker is too loud. And in this way, you can be able then to hear properly in the language that you have selected. In terms of who we're expecting on the program today, we have um, a number of speakers that will be taking us through the Capacity Hub. And we also have um, an opportunity to ask questions and get responses from the speakers. Now, moving on to the next slide, just last information about how to use the platform. If you would, if you're unable to request support from the help desk through the Congress platform, please send an email um, to the email address that you can see on your screen. So info at locksforafrica2020.org or go to the support desk at the top of your screen. This session will be recorded and all presentations will be made available on the Locks for Africa platform would like this to be a very interactive session, given that it's also about building your capacity. So we encourage you to type in your questions um, in the chat box. So you are able then to put in your questions and then the, the speakers will be able to respond to those and other participants as well can see the questions that you have then asked. And then moving on to the next slide, I would just like to indicate that there's quite a number of sessions um, that you will, be, you will find interesting and we'll also share these at the end of the session. But please do make sure that you do visit the, the Locks for Africa website to see what other sessions you can participate in. And then lastly, we have a fully packed program and a range of experts that will be speaking on, on various topics and you'll be able to also engage with them as mentioned. So I'd like to really wish everyone to enjoy the session and I will now hand over to Anna to start with the program. Thank you. So, hello everyone. I hope you can see me fine. Um, my name is Anna Zimmerka. I will be the moderator of the session. And yeah, let me start with a very warm welcome to everyone. Um, to the session, Cool Buildings for Cities in Hot Climates. So we're going to be talking about financing energy efficiency for the economy, climate, but also comfort. Um, yeah, as you just heard, this is a capacity session um, under the conference or training session. So we hope to make this very interactive. Um, and we are at the conference Local Climate Solutions for Africa, co-hosted by Igle Africa, the city of Kigali, and the government of Rwanda. Um, so in the Kigali Con Convention Center. Um, this session here is organized by the Program for Energy Efficiency in Buildings. So that's the program I work for. Um, and I will just briefly say who we are, just so you know um, kind of who is organizing this and why. So um, PEEP is a program that combines financing and policy, policy advice for energy efficient buildings. So a big topic um, everywhere, but also in Africa. Um, we work with five different countries for the moment. Um, so that is um, Mexico, Morocco, Senegal, Tunisia, and Vietnam. It's a program implemented by the French um, Development Bank IFD, the GIZ, um, and the French Agency for an Ecological Transition, ADEM. 
and were funded by funds in Germany. So now you know who we are. Who we are. Um, and let me say, I'm particularly happy to be in Kigali today. Um, I lived like three very happy years of my life there, um, living not very far from the convention center in Kachiru and um, well, working in the Iwasa building. So um, yeah, to all the participants from Rwanda, a very warm uh, Mura Oneza and welcome to everyone else. Great, and so I would say, um, let's start with introductions. Um, of course, um, yeah, I mean, we're almost, you know, like it, it feels a bit like a, a real life conference as we used to. And I think we would all love to be together in a room, meet colleagues, maybe be surprised about seeing an old friend in the corridors um, and have a chat. I mean, it's 2020, <laughs> so it's not possible the way we used to, but um, I think at least we can introduce each other um, to the other people in the room. So yeah, I would just invite everyone, um, please um, write your name and maybe who you are in the chat. Um, and we will post this to the other participants so you have an idea of you know, who's there and who are we talking to. Great, and um, without any um, yeah, further ado, um, I'll just quickly introduce why we're here and what the topic is about. So um, yeah, I was also thinking back like about the time I lived in Rwanda um, and it's been five years. And I think if I would walk around in my old area, I would not recognize the city anymore. And this is really why we are here. No? Um, African cities are growing very rapidly. Um, there's construction um, going up, cities grow, whole new, whole areas change their, their face. Um, sometimes even completely new cities are being built like in Senegal, uh, Jamia Jou. Um, and yeah, I think the worldwide figure is um, the built surface will double by 2060. So it's, you know, this uh, century is really about buildings and construction. Um, and I think Africa is seeing the beginnings, but um, we're really on a, on a growth tra trajectory here. So the question is now, um, what kind of houses do we build? No? Are they adapted to the climate? Are they comfortable to live in? You know, um, do they make our cities also livable and friendly um, and good places um, to kind of, you know, breathe and, and be well? Um, or do they maybe need a lot of energy um, to be cool um, and, and to be comfortable in them? So then the next question is like, you know, what does it need to make buildings um, comfortable and cool? Is it really complicated? Is it really expensive? And yeah, we hope to give you a few answers to these questions. Um, and last not but not least, um, because this is of course like um, a Congress by cities and for cities, um, the question, you know, um, what does this mean for cities, you know? Um, do you need to be a city um, swimming in money to kind of address this issue, you know, and are there cities swimming in money globally anywhere? Um, do we have to change a lot, you know? How could you do it? So um, we have one and a half hours. We know this is not very much for like three really, really big topics. Um, but we really hope um, we have three excellent experts that we will introduce in a second. Um, and we really hope to give you kind of a few pointers about these three topics. Um, so um, just quickly looking at the program, um, I think first one is really looking into kind of like the technical side. So what is a cool building? You know, is it difficult? How can you do it? Next speaker will speak about um, the financial side. So um, what does it cost? You know, and are there new business models? And then with the third one, we'll really zoom into um, what does this mean for cities, you know, and how could cities address this? And then, so this is roughly an hour of um, classroom. <laughs> um, you will have the possibility to ask questions, but it's really a lot about kind of input. Um, but then we want to use um, the last half an hour for a discussion with the audience. So um, we would really ask you to ask any questions that you have um, and, and engage. And I think the speakers will, will be able to Dave dive into your um dive into your questions great and just like housekeeping i think we've heard it um yeah please do use the chat function um, don't be shy it will be monitored um and we will collect all the questions that you have um yeah so um with that i'm very happy to introduce our first speaker um and i think um we can already maybe try to get the presentation started because sometimes it takes a little bit um so our first speaker is uh, marie pierre Mignon. She's an engineer and economist with a French agency um, for an ecological transition, ADEM, um, where she works on um, the international portfolio. Um, she's also really like, you know, a hands-on engineer and she worked eight years with um, ADEM's regional office where she worked with cities um, 
in promoting energy efficiency in buildings um, and developing climate strategies for the building sector. So she's going to be speaking about cool buildings for cities in hot climates. Um, yeah, Marie-Pierre, you have the floor. Yes. Hi, everyone. I hope you can see me. Um, um, the one who is sharing his screen uh, should allow me to share it, uh, stopping the sharing them. OK. Thank you. I hope everyone can see, can now see my screen. So I um, will speak. Yeah, maybe if you could put it into presentation mode. Maybe it's still stuck, but. Um... Yeah, I, I already shared, so. Okay. Yeah, I it's like for us. Yeah, perfect. Okay, is it working? Okay, thank you. Sorry for the short technical delay. Hi, everyone. I'm very pleased um, to join the session to present um, you um, the concepts and technical solutions for energy efficient, low carbon and comfortable buildings. The building sector is kind of a sleeping giant for climate change as it accounts for 39% of energy related CO2 emission and as the global building area is expecting to double by 2060 and the energy demand to increase by 50% by 2050. A report from International Energy Agency, The Future of Cooling, published in 2018, also showed uh, that the energy needs for space cooling should triple by 2050. Building sector is facing big challenge to reduce its CO2 emission as occurred by 77 percent is needed by 2050 to reach the climate goal of two degrees. This photo shows how we can build modern, energy efficient and low carbon buildings. We can see several concepts of passive design will develop further like surrounding the building by trees, vegetation and water, or creating shading using solar protection to prevent from heat gain. Three steps are needed for designing cool and low carbon buildings. Avoid, shift, improve. First, we need to avoid energy demand by building design adapted to the local climate. For example, in orienting the building from east to west, exposing only smaller facets to high solar radiation, angles are providing exterior shading and cool air using the vegetation surrounding the building or by maximizing the use of daylight and natural ventilation. Then we need to shift. That means if mechanical cooling and ventilation is still required, energy supply should be covered through renewables, district cooling and solar power coal chains. Then the final step should look for improvements. That means that for remaining energy needs, we should use the most energy efficient systems and equipment. We shouldn't forget that internal equipment contributes to internal heat gains. So the more efficient the appliances are, the lower the heat gains are. Our goal is to build energy efficient and low carbon comfortable buildings. But how could we define a comfortable building? When we look for thermal comfort, what do we accept? Depending on the space type, we have different expectations of comfort. In conditioned spaces with air conditioner, we usually have a narrow tolerance of comfort. And the typical acceptable air temperature range is 22 degrees to 25 degrees. It's important to note that natural ventilation widens the thermal comfort zone with the increase of velocity. The maximum cooling effect is, appro is approximately 5 degrees. In unconditioned spaces, 
we are able to adapt to our environment and we usually have a wider tolerance of comfort. Typical acceptable air temperature range is then between 22 degrees and 30 degrees. To be energy efficient, buildings need to be climate responsive. And there are some lessons we can learn from the past and vernacular construction. A good orientation of a building from east to west and the use of solar protection like veranda or balcony will minimize the solar radiation. It's then important to provide cool surroundings using trees, vegetation, water elements, and to use natural ventilation, allowing the bright to bring cool outdoor air into the building. A combination of natural and thermal mass cooling is really relevant in climates with hot days and cold nights. Moreover, the use of local materials adapted to local climates reduces carbon footprint of a building. The impact of building materials on climate change is a major challenge for the construction sector as they are responsible for more than 50% of a building's greenhouse gas emissions over its entire life cycle. In a sustainable development approach, it is therefore preferable today to develop local supply chains for biosource materials, which have made economic, ecological advantages. Biosource materials are a way to limit the building environmental footprint due to their ability to store atmospheric carbon, their renewable nature and their low grade energy. But beyond the environmental impact, these supply chains could contribute to, create, to the creation of non-relocatable jobs with high added value. Lots of biosource materials can be used. Wood, bagas, which is a fibrous residue of sugarcane, it is widely present in tropical and equatorial climates. It is used to produce vegetable concretes. Bamboo is also an interesting material, which many people consider to be the building material of the future. It is rapidly renewed with low energy consumption and has interesting mechanical properties. Tifa, which is a harmful and invasive aquatic plant, can potentially be an ecological asset to reduce greenhouse gas emissions thanks to its thermal insulation capacity. It is mainly present in West Africa, but also in most of the subtropical and tropical areas of the world. This graph shows the importance of working with all the chain of actors since the early beginning of the project to maximize the chances of success. The programmers can set energy efficiency and environmental goals. Using bioclimatic and passive design, the project manager should define the best technical solutions to meet these requirements. A fine analysis of the local climate and surroundings should provide all the data they need to deeply adapt the building to its environment. Final user, shouldn't be forgotten and he should get informed and educated on how properly use a building to achieve comfort. For example, by providing a user guide regarding the local climate, we should use the most appropriate design. Should it be closed or open? When is the use of air conditioner really needed? To reduce the use of air conditioner, we prefer open design with a maximization of bioclimatic concepts to allow a high level of comfort. But under some climates, it isn't possible to meet a sufficient level of comfort without using air conditioner. If the use of air conditioner is required, we should prefer closed design. This slide shows the most important bioclimatic concepts for open building design without air conditioning. And the humid climates. 
A lightweight building, which allow a good air circulation, will provide cooling by natural ventilation. The design should include large ventilation openings, light color and reflective coating, roof insulation, a maximization of vegetation in the surroundings to provide external shading and fresh air is also welcome. We shouldn't forget to arrange the indoor of the building to allow a good air circulation inside the building while preventing any obstacle. And the dry climate, a massive building blocking heat and encouraging air circulation should be designed. The use of half thermal mass materials associated to good solar protection measures will delay the increase of the indoor temperature during the day. Night natural ventilation will help to cool the buildings in climates with hot days and cool nights. Short openings should remain closed during the day to keep cool inside and be open during the night to welcome fresh air from the outside. The second slide shows the most important bioclimatic concepts for closed buildings designed with air conditioning. Under humid climates, a midway building with every efficient mechanical cooling can be combined with natural ventilation for cooling. The building should maximize the sun protection to prevent from heat gains using external shading, light color and reflective coating, double glazing. A good air tightness is also important to prevent hot air from outside to enter in the building. And the dry climates, we prefer a massive building blocking heat, which could be cooled down mechanically. Passive design does not mean no air conditioner at no time. In some really hot and dry climates, it is not possible to reach a sufficient level of comfort without air conditioner. It is then important to use closed design with solar protection measures, like light color and reflective coating, hard thermal mass insulation to prevent heat gains from outside. The use of energy efficient electrical appliances is also important to prevent internal heat gains. Efficient air conditioner could then be used to cool the building. In the previous slide, we've seen there are different cooling methods to avoid heat gains into the building. That's why a deeply analysis of a local climate and the site using data temperature, relative humidity, wind, solar radiation, at the beginning of a project is required. A good understanding of the climate and location will allow the architect to select appropriate cooling methods to avoid heat gains into the building and to encourage heat dissipation from the building. Lots of modeling tools are available on internet to conduct this analysis. It's important to remind that bioclimatic design is doing with and not against the climate. Explanations should also be given to the occupants to allow him to be able to operate the building properly to achieve comfort using the minimal amount of energy. How to reduce internal heat gains using efficient electrical appliances, switching them off when not used when uh, the windows should be open or closed and when the use of artificial cooling is really needed. A monitoring of the building to assure there isn't any unexpected increase in the energy consumption due to inappropriate use of the building should also be implemented. If you'd like to get more information, you can have a look on our publication, Beta Design for Cool Buildings. Thanks everyone for your attention. Great. Thank you very much, Marie Pierre. Um, and I'm just wondering um, do we have any questions in the chat? So, um, otherwise, we will just continue with the next um, presentation. Um, if there are no burning questions, and I think we can also have questions during the discussion. Um, no, I don't see any burning questions right now. So um, I think after that first um, look into what is actually um, possible on the technical side, and I think we saw that um, 
it's really a matter of thinking about the climate that you're in um, and being a bit smart about it. Um, and then it doesn't actually mean that we have to you know, completely change the way we do a building. We just have to do them a bit smarter. So um, the question is now um, to do these buildings a little bit smarter, um, haha, um, does this come with an extra cost? And if so, um, what is the possibility to factor that in? And for that, um, we have another expert, um, Abdul Isek um, from Senegal. Um, he is an energy and financing expert. Um, he has a consulting company that works with both the public and private sector um, on basically low carbon and climate resilient industrial development. He works on climate finance. Um, he works with industry and cities, was involved in the preparation and the implementation of the Senegalese um, NDC, as well as kind of like in the design of the process for the Green Climate Fund. So I think he's um, well, a perfect match um, to talk about this. Um, and yeah, I also have to say, since 2020, I have the pleasure to work with him in the context of the PEAT program. So with that, um, Abdullah, um, the floor is yours. Um, and we're looking forward to your presentation. And I think we, at least I cannot hear you yet. Um, uh, I think we still don't have your sound. Many thanks, Anna. I'm sorry, I was on mute. And, uh, very good. <laughs> yeah. Hi, everyone. Very happy, very glad to, to be here. Um, uh, I will uh, have a short presentation on uh, uh, energy efficiency, how energy efficiency is important. Uh, uh, um, and then I will go through the main barriers to finance energy efficiency and uh, finish with uh, so, uh, presenting a few financial uh, instruments and business models. Um, as you probably know, uh, the living standards rise and population urbanized will uh, uh, create a, a contraction boom, uh, specifically, specifically in emerging economies and developing countries. Uh, for Africa, for example, you will see that um, the, the global uh, floor uh, of building will be multiplied by four uh, in 2060. So, and uh, as Marie Pierre said earlier, uh, the building accounts of 36% uh, of the energy consumption and 39% of greenhouse gas, global greenhouse gas emissions. So, uh, you can imagine how, what will be the impact of, of this construction boom. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, building is, should be taking an account if you want to achieve the Paris Agreement goals or the sustainable development goals um, uh, and uh, as marie said also it's very important to 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 do uh, to act at, at the earlier stage uh, uh, because it's easier uh, when the at the conception and the planning construction phase uh, otherwise um, the, the the mitigation potential will be probably locked for uh, more than 50 years uh, because the, 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 um, the investment life cycle of a building is very, is very long. So it's important to, to act at the early stage. Um, so is it clear that this or without energy efficient measures will, will have a, a huge construction uh, investment? So the decision we will make today um, have an effect over many decades uh, and we if we don't uh, uh, construct green buildings now we will uh, uh, not be able to achieve uh, our targets in terms of climate uh, so the question could be why the financing of energy efficiency is still timid yeah. this is the, maybe the main question we can we can ask and the answer can be one will, one can say that the, the additional cost is very very high uh, but not really if uh, uh, we we analyze it uh, uh, we can see that the, the additional cost will be from minus 
0 0.5, it means that sometimes it's cheaper to, to have a, um, an efficient, energy efficient building up to 12.5%. Uh, and uh, it's not really a big deal normally. So uh, why don't we act? I think the, our experience show that the, 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 the the problem we have in the building sector is that we have a lot of actors and each of the of actor has a particular challenge. Uh, financial institutions have their own challenge to, 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 to finance energy efficient building. They have a lack of, of knowledge and capacity. They don't know how to assess uh, efficient uh, energy efficient building projects. Uh, project de developers or a private investor should not know um, uh, what are the best available technologies. So if they don't know it, they would not uh, uh, do it uh, at the conception phase. Uh, there is a lack of uh, energy efficient policy in general, and it's, done, it's very important to have this clear policy to enable a good environment to develop uh, um, financing uh, uh, instruments for energy efficiency in buildings. Uh, there are also a lack of dedicated long-term funds. Uh, funds uh, and buildings have a very um, life, long life cycle. Uh, cycle, so it's it's important to have long-term funds to to to, to finance uh, energy efficiency. Uh, and you can also see that uh, in general, it's uh, energy efficiency project in general are um, have a high perceived and user credit risk. So this is one of the, uh, from our perspective, one of the main uh, problems we have with financing energy, energy efficiency. Uh, the other aspect which is very important is the maturity of the market. And financing instrument should be tailored to uh, the maturity of the of the market. For a non-mature market, we will need uh, mostly public financing instruments such as budget uh, grants, tax exemption, for example, um, uh, budget financing, uh, and for moderately uh, mo uh, mature market, we will. Uh, need uh, energy efficiency funds, uh, dedicated credit lines, or sharing facility. And for a very developed market, we can have commercial financing and uh, using energy service companies models. So it's really important to uh, to choose a financial instrument which is adapted to the maturity of the market. In, here in Senegal, we had a, an experience few years ago, five years ago, when the government uh, uh, gave a, a loan to a commercial bank uh, to uh, uh, finance uh, solar PV systems and uh, solar heating systems. But the results were very mixed because at the stage, the, mar the market was not uh, really mature. We didn't have a network of providers. Uh, we were not, the bank was not able to assess the project, so it was uh, very difficult and the result was not uh, uh, very uh, interesting. Uh, here you have a different list of uh, uh, instruments, uh, public instruments uh, and market-based instruments. They are all very common and very classic. Uh, we just need to adapt them to uh, energy efficiency. Uh, I would just uh, talk about uh, uh, three or four of them that are more uh, innovative, I would say. It will be uh, green bonds, public-private uh, partnerships, and then energy performance contracts. Um, uh, green bonds, uh, most of you knows what is a, a bond. So a green bond is uh, a bond uh, who funds, whose funds are exclusively used to finance eligible green project. So uh, in general, it's applicable for large uh, scale buildings or a pool of buildings. And uh, the, the, the investment should be at least uh, 30 million US dollar because the transaction costs are very, and very high. It can be issued by 
a government or a multilateral uh, development bank or uh, a commercial bank or a government or a private company. So the green bonds achieve investor diversity uh, and uh, it helped to build a market uh, by mobilizing private sector financing for energy efficiency and climate, climate projects. You also have specific funds uh, that allow to a pool of investors from different sources uh, to give some uh, some instruments such as loans, uh, equity, and guarantee uh, according to the to the market needs. Um, uh, which is, what is interesting with these funds that it comes with a technical assistance, uh, which is more flexible than uh, a financial institution. So, uh, and this delegated financial mechanism can be become a revolving or permanent tool. Uh, as long as the, the, the loans are reimbursed, uh, yet the, the fund can be uh, uh, revolved. Uh, yeah. Then you have a uh, public-private partnership uh, that I think we use a lot for uh, to build facilities such as road, high, highways, power plants, and it can be also used uh, for building energy efficiency. Um, uh, it's a, a long-term collaboration scheme between uh, a public authority and a, a private sector for provision for a public service. And it's widely used to build, to build for example, large-scale public buildings such as hospital. Um, and uh, what is interesting with a PPP that we can, uh, at the same time, uh, uh, add other criteria such as employment, awareness raising uh, in the in the in the contract and um, it allows a, a substantial uh, scaling up investment but the contractor need to have uh, energy efficient specific uh, experience uh, and uh, lastly we have uh, energy performance contract um, which is very developed in uh, in europe and uh, where we use a uh, an energy service company who will be between uh, the project developer and the and the financial institution. An energy efficiency energy service company uh, is a legal person that deliver energy service, uh, and the payment of the service is exclusively based on the achievement on energy savings. So uh, there are different models. I will just show one of them. Uh, the guarantee saving, uh, which uh, where the, the, the energy service company will be, uh, will help the bank and the, the client to uh, achieve the, 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 the savings, uh, will help to monitor the, the, the construction and the, the operating of the, of the system, and he will be paid uh, accordingly to the, uh, the savings that will be made. Sometimes the ESCO can also be an investor uh, and he can take a loan uh, and then invest with the project developer and uh, will be able to, to, to repay the loan by the savings that will be made on the, on the, on the project. Yeah, globally, this is uh, the, the most common uh, financial, new financial uh, tools or business model you will have for to develop energy efficiency in the, in the buildings. Uh, I would like to finish uh, the presentation by uh, um, trans talking about transparency, which is very key for all these uh, financial instruments and business models. Uh, transparency means uh, have a, a labeling or a certification which is uh, recognized. For buildings, for example, you will have HQE, mainly used in France. Uh, you will have uh, LEED, uh, used in, in Europe or in UK. And you can have also Edge Building, which is the, the certification from IFC. This certification can allow the, the, the project developer and the financial institution to be sure that the building respects the minimum criteria that uh, Marie-Pierre Marie showed earlier. You need also to have a continuous monitoring and energy performance uh, for contract manager, investor, and users. Uh, it's very, very, very important to, to be able to uh, measure at any time 
uh, the, the, the efficiency of the, of the building. We had here an experience in, in, in Dakar. We had the honor to, to do some energy audits for the buildings of the city of Dakar. And it was really interesting to see that by implementing an uh, energy monitoring system, the city was able to save 10 to 15% of the energy bills because they were able to, to, to manage the, the energy contracts with the national uh, electricity provider. They were able to, to, to reduce energy consumption by uh, communicating with the, the end users. And it was really interesting uh, to see the, the, what, what we can achieve just by doing energy monitoring system, uh, which is very cheap. And uh, this one was uh, uh, had a, a payback period of only three months. So it's really important. And the last thing which is very important also is to have a periodic uh, technical, uh, financial, legal, and social impact report which should be done by an independent uh, uh, one uh, person, uh, not by the, the, the energy or the energy service provider, not by the, the, the financial institution, but by a, a consulting firm which is independent and who will uh, help to be sure that the interests of each party are taken in account and that the infrastructure is kept in a good working order because after uh, the few years of contract, the building need to be uh, 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 operational. Yeah, so the, I am at the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you very much uh, for, your, for your attention. And uh, Anna, you can back the floor. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Dr. Lai. Um, yeah, I think, um, very fascinating presentation. Um, I think very deep also, a lot of detail, and maybe um, just like to keep um, two thoughts in your hand. Um, so the first takeaway really um, on the very basic level is um, energy efficiency might come with a bit of a higher upfront cost, but it's actually less than we expect. Um, and the other point was um, it has really short payback times. But then still, I think, you know, when we're talking about kind of an upfront investment, um, it's always a question how to do that. And I think you, you showed us really good examples um, in a, um, you know, a bit of an abstract way. So I think um, this is a really good pre pre preparation because now we're gonna roll up our sleeves and I'm just checking. Um, I think there were no questions in the chat, just to be really sure. But I think um, so far um, you've just been listening. Um, no worries. Um, I think we can also have a lot of questions um, in the discussion round. Um, yeah, it is my pleasure now um, to um, introduce um, Sumaya Mohamed. Um, she is, well, how do I introduce her? She's an expert on sustainable energy. She's a seasoned city expert. And uh, from how I got to know her, she's also really a strategist and a visionary, I would almost say. Um, and she will um, kind of bring you the hands-on experience from um, well, from, from her work, basically. Um, currently, she's um, director um, in Uganda for Power for All. Um, she has worked between 2011 and 17. She has developed and managed renewable and energy efficiency products in Cape Town. Um, and like she, she won a lot of prizes for that. She was the best capital project manager in renewable energy and energy efficiency projects. Um, she was the lead for C40's municipal energy efficiency network. Um, yes, and so she um, developed um, and a very interesting and very innovative results-based financing mechanism. And yeah, we're very happy that she will be um, talking about her experience, um, kind of also her approach, you know, as a as an employee in a city, uh, as, a, as a manager there, how do you um, tackle these issues? How do you get started? Um, and as she's now living in Kampala, I think she will also kind of like broaden that experience with more examples. So um, Sumaya, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Anna, and um, wow, um, that introduction, um, it's really like made me blush. So thank you for, you know, that comprehensive introduction. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, as Anna said, my name is Maya Mohammed, and I really wanted to, you know, um, start this presentation by giving really, you know, a city's experience. So we're going to look at a few, you know, financial instruments um, that has been implemented by cities. 
So the first one is obviously the one that um, I assisted to implement and develop within the city of Cape Town, and that is a results-based financing mechanism or performance guarantee contract. And then as my colleague Abdullaya, he focused on, you know, um, he called it um, an EPC or uh, ESCO, or it's also known as a shared savings contract. Now, this example comes from, again, from South Africa, and it is from, you know, a national government entity called Public Works within South Africa, because I do recognize that outside of South Africa, there are different municipalities and you have different, you know, um, devolved um, states that, you know, impacts how you can develop and implement projects. And then finally, I'm just going to touch very, very quickly on green bonds. And I want to spend a little bit more time, you know, focusing on an energy efficiency fund that was um, implemented by a Kurulene municipality. So it's another municipality. And then also just touch on how does grants really, you know, um, tie into this whole, you know, financing instrument for a municipality. So just to recap quickly and just touching on a results based financing model. So the first thing is, is that you have to, you know, provide that upfront capital outlay. And I think that that is an important, you know, difference from either an ESCO or an EPC mechanism. And then the, another important, you know, aspect is, is that you pre-agree the results upfront, it's agreed and it's signed so that both parties knows that if these results are not achieved or the savings aren't achieved, then the contractor is not going to get paid. And that really, you know, kind of drives innovation with this model. And it was quite attractive, you know, for us. And I think the other, you know, key difference is that all of the savings from day one belongs to the entity. So it is not a shared savings mechanism. You don't have to, you know, take any of that savings and, you know, pay the contractor. All of that savings belongs to your organization um, if you implement this. So let's quickly look at, you know, what was the thinking and how did we go about this? So one of the first things that we done in the city of Cape Town was really, we wanted to implement projects and build our capacity and build and understand, you know, the data. It all starts with data. You need to have your data. You need to understand what is the potential and what, you know, is, is, is the opportunity that you have. Once we had that, we asked ourselves, can we access donor funds? And in our um, example for the city of Cape Town, the answer was yes. Now, if you have donor funds, this is another way in order to you know, de-risk and to give donor confidence if you use a results-based financing mechanism. And we used um, the Danita funds way back in 2006 to implement the first version of, you know, or testing this results-based financing mechanism. Later on, when the donor funds landscape kind of, you know, slowed down and it was harder to get donor money and the city still did not invest um, in energy efficiency because it did not recognize this model um, at the time, we then asked ourselves, can we access, you know, interest rates lower than 15% or does the institution, which was the city of Cape Town, can it access lower, you know, debt, um, debt financing? And it was an interesting one. So the city had a very good credit rating and it turned out that at the time, shared savings mechanisms were being offered at an interest rate between 15 and 25%. But the city of Cape Town was accessing debt financing between six and 8%. So it made sense for us to, you know, really look into this results-based financing mechanism and working with our financial department, we then, you know, secured some funds and the city then, you know, invested into you know, energy efficiency and using this results-based financing model to finance that work. My colleague Abdullah done a great job to emphasize on you know, the need to focus on what is that business model. So if the business model is with an intent to implement energy efficiency and renewable energy in your organization to reduce OPEX costs and to increase the kind of infrastructure assets that you want to own and get access to new technology, then you want to secure the best financial mechanism. Then the next question is why? It needs to fit with your organization. And most importantly, the organization needs to have, you know, the capacity and the necessary systems in order to execute this. In order for, you know, you to retain the lowest cost with maximum returns, to have an optimized organization, i.e. 
you are enjoying the benefits of energy efficiency, both from a financial and a technical perspective in your organization, and that the model is really attractive to the organization. And I'll come back to the city of Cape Town's um, experience towards the end. So let's just quickly look at what happened with public works. Now, public works, as I indicated, it's a national government entity in South Africa. And public works did not have access to any donor funds, which made things a little bit more you know, complex for them to really you know, want to understand, implement, and really drive you know, energy efficiency within its organization. And public works looked at all of the financial mechanisms and they just went, ah, um, shared savings might work for our organization. So the key thing here is that public works had initial data, but they did not have a robust you know, data mechanism in place when they just you know, started off with the shared savings mechanism. The other complexity that they ran into is, is that a shared savings mechanism from a contractual perspective, it's really complex to run because you are now speaking of, and this really depends on you know, your um, financial or public institutions procurement policies, but in South Africa, if you develop a project that needs to run over three years, the more complicated the tender is and the more lengthy it is, it's going to you know, execute that tender. So lots of lessons learned on you know, how to write a shared savings you know, contract in a government space. And then finally and ultimately, they went through a very steep learning curve because obviously, you know, building the type of capacity and systems, but jumping straight into this very legal and complex, you know, contract, it turned out that they did not embed monitoring and verification from a third party. Um, and it turned out that it caused some serious legal um, challenges with the savings that got issued. And that was a real learning point for the sector. Now, this was executed in the early days and have since obviously evolved. And the great thing is with the shared savings mechanism is that they really can implement a large number of projects, you know, um, at a go. I'm going to move on. And the next one is green bonds. Now, green bonds, as my, as my, as my colleague has um, previously indicated, is, you know, you really need to have that credit worthiness. The city of Johannesburg in South Africa was one of the first municipalities that ended up executing um, a green bond. And they already had you know, a pipeline of projects that they wanted to implement. I remember in the early, um, 20, in early 2016, I got contacted by the finance department inside of the city of Cape Town. And they used all of the data that we developed with um, the energy efficiency and renewable energy program to really build the case for why the city of Cape Town needed to execute the green bond. That green bond was later issued and it was used to you know, um, focus on the water management projects that the city wanted to you know, drive. So this is again just showing you, you know, how cities are using you know, this and it's important because you need to have that credit worthiness but again, it comes down to the financial mechanisms and the data monitoring mechanisms that your organization has. Uh, there are many other you know, examples on the sub-Saharan continent. I see that Kenya has also recently you know, dabbled into the green bond space where they are going to access over $30 million um, to provide um, sustainable um, buildings for students. And then there's also, you know, many green bonds being issued by Nigeria because they want to finance um, their, climate, their climate change programs using a green bond. So that is more at the government level in the Kenya and Nigeria example. Now, let's look at the Ikruleni municipality. Um, this is again in South Africa. Now, what I haven't told you is that in the early years, the Department of Energy in South Africa in the early 2009, they recognized that municipalities have a lot of old infrastructure and that if they can develop uh, energy efficiency infrastructural program to stimulate and jumpstart, you know, municipalities thinking about, you know, the need for embedding energy efficiency inside of their business model, this was a good start. So all of the municipalities went through, you know, a process of applying for these funds and I know the team at the Ekuruleni municipality very well because we were one of those municipalities that, you know, we started off in the early 2000s and nine accessing um, this, this government fund. But then the government fund kind of, you know, it dwindled, I would say early 
early 2013. And that is where you know, both municipalities really had to think about how do you sustainably adopt a financial model? Now, while the city of Cape Town went for you know, a results-based financing mechanism, and that was also because the city of Cape Town's energy efficiency program was being led by the environmental department at the time. Now, here with the Ekuruleni municipality, it was the electricity department that ended up leading with these projects. And the reason why I'm highlighting you know, this key difference is they went for an energy efficiency fund. And it actually turned out that they started off calling it an environmental levy, but I think um, National Treasury obviously has to approve any tariffs. And I think they ran into a challenge with you know, proving why they needed to slap on an environmental levy and they had to rethink you know, with the, the financing mechanism and they came up with an energy efficiency fund. So because the electricity department you know, generates um, and collects all of the electricity sales within you know, this municipality in South Africa, they were able to justify the investment and the need to reinvest 0.25% of the electricity income that the municipality generates and use that money to really you know, continue implementing energy efficiency. So another key thing is that within a financial you know, um, municipality landscape, it's very hard to prove financial savings. And I can see why you know, they, 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 they could not show you know, that they can ring fence the savings because I went through a similar exercise and it makes sense why they ended up going for an energy efficiency fund. But again, the key thing is that, you know, Kuruleni municipality was again one of those leading municipalities where they had a lot of, you know, strategy and policy support way before any of us even got, you know, donor grants to implement these projects. But they cultivated that administrative and political support from the early days. And they also used that donor funds, you know, to build their own internal capacity. Um, so that is just, you know, an interesting example. So as um, Anna said, where do, you, where do you start? If you are a municipal or government official and you're asking yourself, so great, great that all of these financial mechanisms are out there, but where does one start? You need to start with building a strategy and having that you know, policy support within your organization. If your organization does not have any strategies or does not have any policies that is gonna support this initiative, you are going to have a very hard time executing or adopting a new financial mechanism that is catered you know, for renewable energy or energy efficiency. And then don't just jump into the financial mechanism, really prove that concept. People need to, people want to have, you know, they want something that is de-risk and they want to know that this is going to work. So you really need to also, you know, build that capacity within the organization. And it's not just one department. When I say the entire organization, think about who are the strategic departments that you really need to speak to. You, it is hinged on technical knowledge. You are going to have to be very savvy in this department. So build that technical you know, resource within the organization and ensure that you start understanding you know, the, the baselines, data collection, and also the MRV component that is required and linked you know, to the sector. And then finally, don't just, you know, present the results. Results need to be linked, you know, with strategic goals and objectives and also show the impact at scale. So just because you're doing one project, there's no reason why you can't model that out and show what is, you know, the potential at scale because that is what, uh, that is one of the levers that will speak to the more strategic, you know, thinkers within your organization. And then ask yourself, what is the right mechanism? What is the credit worthiness of this organization? What is the risk per profile? What is the investment portfolio that the organization you know, looks at? So let's go back to the city of Cape Town. So again, the city of Cape Town, since the early 2000s, it really worked on you know, building that you know, policy strategy, environmental you know, action plan you know, support. And you can see across this timeline, it really built the momentum to, to get the municipality focused that this is an important sector. And then we took a very systematic approach of executing projects. We didn't speak about the low-hanging fruits, but low-hanging fruits such as smart meters. And Abdullah gave a brilliant example of how you know, they executed that um, all the way out in Senegal. In the city of Cape Town, we also started with one of the first you know, energy efficiency building projects. 
where it focused on you know, the impact and the need for smart meters, but it was coupled with behavior change because we often think of the technology, but we don't think of you know, the internal processes and mechanisms that one needs to also alter when you are implementing these, these, um, these projects. And then also, you know, we started with the LED streetlights and that was executed by the electricity department. So there was a partnership that was going on between, you know, the two departments um, in order to understand the impact and building, you know, this business model for, for the organization. So I'm going to move on to the next slide because this slide is really, you know, for me, the crux of how we took the systematic approach, but we build the momentum and capacity starting off with donor funds. So the first project was executed in 2003, and at that time, the city only had, you know, a state of energy report. We then later got, you know, some more donor funds, and we were able to do 14 buildings. And that ended up being the first results-based financing project that was implemented in 2009 with the NIDA funds. And we were able to secure, at the same time, you know, um, funding from the Department of Energy to execute street lighting. As I said, early um, 2012, everyone you know, kind of ran into similar um, problems where the donor landscape started dwindle, dwindling, but we ended up developing an internal resource management policy for, for the city and we ended up really you know, driving home, what does this RBF mechanism mean for the city? And that is when the city you know, adopted this financial mechanism and actually gave us funds. And this enabled us, you can see that we ended up going from four buildings to now 14 buildings, expanding into street light, traffic lights, and smart metering. And that program systematically went, went on and is ongoing um, because the city has a large portfolio of assets. And then finally, just driving this importance of savings. This is actually, you know, um, one of the slides that I developed while I was still at the city of Cape Town. It's outdated, but the point is you need to be able to prove what is that investment what is the total savings? And you can see that, you know, for that overall portfolio of program, the payback period is seven years. But bear in mind, we were given certain parameters by our financial, you know, department that if the project has a payback period of seven years, they will go and find, you know, the capital in order to, you know, keep on investing into these projects. And you can see how those um, payback periods also, you know, range across, you know, traffic lights, street lights, and buildings. And also, you know, what was the split of grant and um, city funding that was invested to, to invest into, you know, energy efficiency. And I think it's important, but again, you know, we used this data and this information to, you know, speak to the strategy and the direction that you know, the municipality wanted to go. So for me, some of the key takeaways are, you need a champion. Someone needs to be brave enough to embark on this journey, but also know that you do not need to reinvent the wheel. So start off with the low hanging fruits. Again, develop partnerships. There are so many partnerships that you that you can lean on. So do not feel that you that you're embarking on this journey alone. There is a lot of help and support out there. And then most importantly, build capacity internally and look at the systems that is required in order to really develop a sound foundation. And then most importantly is to use the data to support the strategy of the organization and build the case for why this financial mechanism is going to lead to you know, improved results and improved services and infrastructure. So you need to develop that business model that is fit for your organization. And with that, I want to say thank you. I would like to say thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Samaya, for a very interesting deep dive into um, how you could actually start your strategy. Um, and I was really impressed by kind of really following you on that path of like, you know, starting from kind of having an idea to really build up um, your strategy step by step. No, And I think um, this is really, I mean, what I take away from your presentation, you don't have to, you know, Rome wasn't built in a day. So, I mean, you really... Um, find out what you're talking about, then build your strategy around it, and then find your allies. Um, and yeah, I think that became really clear. And I hope um, yeah, this is also really something that we would like to, to kind of like share with the participants in this training that, yeah, I think it's a, it's a process now and you have to start somewhere. Great, so um, after three really um, 
full presentations. Um, we're now moving into the second part of our training, which is um, a discussion. So um, well, I'm looking at you, I can't see you. <laughs> but um, yeah, we would like to invite our audience um, to kind of discuss with us, um, because actually, yeah, we want to see um, what can be done to support energy efficiency in buildings in cities. Um, and we would like um, to ask you to, um, First of all, well, we have a little um, interactive um, tool. So um, I'm gonna ask my colleague to please put that um, link into the chat. Um, and um, I hope everyone can see it. So it's basically, yeah, we just want to ask you, what do you think are the biggest barriers to implementing energy efficiency in cities? You know, and it's like, you know, just, um, it's a little um, tool. You just like throw in one word. If you have another thing that comes up, um, throw that in as well. Um, and then we will see on the screen um, what people think. So um, yeah, it would be great if you um, could answer that. And um, in the meantime, um, because I think it's not yet in the chat for everyone. Yeah, but I think we can we can wait for that. And as soon as we have a few results, I'm going to ask my colleague Sarah to let us know. Great. So I think um, with that um, we will move into our panel discussion. And um, I would ask um, our three speakers to switch on the video so we can see you. Um, and I would ask everyone who hasn't done so yet in the, um, in the panel, uh, the audience to please um, send your questions, um, post them in the chat, and then we can see them here. Great. Um, Okay, um, and so I think in the meantime, um, well, I have of course a few questions um, that I would like to ask you. Um, so um, maybe I'll start with um, maybe I'll start with Abdullah, um, because I think um, you've also done um, quite a lot of like consultancy work for clients. Um, and um, what would you say was the biggest surprise? I mean. You know, when people start looking at their energy consumption and their financials, um, you know, what is it that, um, that that helps them the most getting active? Thank you, uh, Anna. Um, I, I think that the, the most important is uh, what I present in the last slide is that we did a lot of energy audits uh, or energy uh, management project for cities, for, for industries. But the, the main very surprising thing that the, the companies or the cities that didn't know that they can already do savings without any investment, just by uh, having uh, an energy management system or just having a one focal point who is taking care of checking the, 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 the energy bills and then giving feedback to the user. Sometimes there are some buildings that was not used at all, at all. And in these buildings, there were some energy consumptions or energy bills that were paid by the city without knowing that it was not used by the city. So it's really in general important for them to, 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 um, to understand the, 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 uh, what they have, what are their buildings, what are the, the, the where come from the, the, the electricity bill. Because the problem is the one who pay the, the, the energy bills is not the one who is uh, using the electricity in general. And the one who is using the electricity doesn't care about uh, any uh, energy or environmental concerns. So it's uh, and it's the same same thing in the private sector. If you build a, a, a facility and you, you you give it to someone who use it and pay uh, monthly, um, uh, he pay monthly something, but he doesn't care about uh, the, the, the energy efficiency because he just use it for a short term. And when you build the the, the, the facility. Uh, you don't have the, the uh, an interest to 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 pay ten percent or fifteen percent more investment to make it efficient because it's not your problem. You don't gonna use it. So I think this is really something really important in general. 
uh, that and if the the, the, the city or uh, in a, in a, an industry or a building owner uh, identify this potential sometime it's uh, uh, the beginning of a new story because they say that ah we can save 15 percent and this 15 percent can help maybe to achieve some some works on lighting or some air cooling and the next year they can do refurbish a, a small building and it's a start of something and then they can have the confidence to build their capacity and after that going uh, to a financial institution for example to, to to take a loan or something like that. so this i think this is the something very surprising and it's 100 percent times we see that they can achieve savings without any investment just by uh, energy monitoring system great uh, yeah mm. that speaks really to starting <laughs> because you might be surprised what you already find there um, and it might be a way of, fin of, of starting the financing um, another question that goes a little bit in that direction is um, and i think it's maybe a question to sumaya um, is the question um well, what do you need you know once you're over this first step of saying okay you know we, we looked we found something we kind of like you know uh, captured all the low-hanging fruits where you can already um, save money already now. Um, if you see that you need, um, let's say, external financing from a bank or someone else, what is needed um, to put together a very convincing um, proposal? You know, and I think, I mean, I'm putting this question large, you know, because I, I think we've seen this. It depends on your situation, you know, like what is your access to financing as a city? You know, are there any you know, opportunities from, let's say, um, you know, maybe even national support programs, etc. Um, so, yeah, what is needed to actually convince? <laughs> um, wow, Anna, you're really, you're really, um, you know, putting all of the interesting questions on my plate, but let me, let me see how I can dissect this one. So, it definitely depends, you know, obviously on the organization and the context. So, I just want to put that out there, but... It took us some time, Anna, as I said, you know, you need to be very systematic in your approach and how you collect that data and how that data starts to get linked to the organization's, you know, policy and strategy. We had the opportunity, I mean, from the presentation that I that I gave, and I'm just speaking from my own experience here, is that, you know, if you if you understand, you know, what it means and you start modeling out the impact at large. And that is why I made that point of, you need to be able to show, even if you just done one little building, how does that, you know, savings look like if you're gonna, you know, do this at scale. So if you are wanting to try to, you know, convince um, the powers that be, and you especially in, you know, um, municipality, you need to be able to show that impact at scale and what does it mean for the organization. Um, I think for us, we done, we, the other thing that we done is while you're busy, you know, putting this proposal together and you're making multiple presentations because it takes a lot of work. I, I'm, I'm not going to lie. It's not just about writing a document and then, you know, submitting it to the powers that be. It requires active engagement and active, you know, um, presenting so that you can get feedback. You're going to go, you have to maybe go back and, you know, refine certain parameters. Um, it is quite, you know, a process that you're going to embark on. And the key thing is that, you know, um, depending on who the lead organization within, you know, um, the lead department within the organization is, you might have to work with the financing department, you might have to work with, you know, um, I had to work with the electricity department, with the um, facilities management department, because they were managing the buildings, and also the transport department. So you've got to, you know, have that network and you need to be able to, you know, factor in how, how does this affect the organization at large, present and make sure that there is a uniform consensus on the strategic impact, the direction, and also, you know, the benefits. So I don't have, you know, a conclusive answer, but my point is, is that you need to be able to really just, you know, um, take that information Put it on paper, yes, but then go and workshop it, get feedback, speak with your colleagues, build momentum. And if you can get, you know, um, an ally within your organization, because that is what we done. We build allies in the transport department, we, do, we build allies, allies in the facility 
with his management department. And in every opportunity when they went and presented to the executive um, management team at the city, they would further reinforce the need of this and re-emphasize you know, the opportunity to really invest in this. That's great. Now, um, and actually, I'm really sorry, but um, <laughs> I think there's another question that kind of builds on that. So um, I think I'll open that um, to all of you um, and I'm just going to quickly read it out. Um, so this is about um, capacity building. No? When we're talking about allies, I think you talk about your own project, but you talk also about the people around you. So what type or style of capacity building did you find worked best with your colleagues? How did you get buy-in from people who were not on board? So this is kind of like turning well, people into allies. <laughs> and I think maybe, I think it's actually a question to all three of you, but if I could ask you to be fairly brief, um, then yeah, maybe we start with um, Abdullah because I see you first there. And I think you have to unmute yourself. Yeah. Okay, for me, uh, I think the capacity building will depend on the, on the targeted people. Uh, from a city perspective, you will have the municipal council and the, the mayor and the users. They will need a global capacity building on uh, what is uh, energy efficiency and what are the, the context, why the, 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 the municipality would like to achieve uh, to do some... Uh, uh, energy savings or mitigation action. Uh, so it's important to explain uh, the context and what are the main technologies. Uh, from the technical department, I think the most uh, relevant I have seen is to have a day-to-day -day training, a kind of technical assistance to help them to build their tools and uh, for more in incremental um, uh, incremental actions to, to build capacity and help them uh, having their own uh, uh, tools to, 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 to do the, the job by, by themselves. Thank you. Great, and I think I'll hand over to Marie-Pierre. Um, yeah, I think um, it's important to train all the members of uh, all the services of the city, uh, um, of the building city service, uh, to energy efficiency concept. And maybe just to mention that um, if you are, um, we developed a, a MOOC and sustainable uh, construction in the tropical. Um, humid area and it could be really interesting and if you would like it's going to be launched in 2021 and if you'd like to get more information on it maybe um, you can join uh, our PIM newsletter because it's going to be a way to keep informed on the upcoming uh, trainings uh, which are going to be launched uh, in 2021 so I think as Abdullah Isaac um, said, it's really important to raise awareness of all the city's uh, member and services on energy efficient and uh, local bioclimatic uh, concepts. Great. Yeah. And I think we should post the link to the, um, to the training course also in the chat. Um, so I think my colleague is just doing that right now. Um, and I think Sumaya, uh, do you also want to add um, <laughs> to that question? Because I think it's also really... Yeah, I think, you know, both Marie and um, Abdullaya, you know, gave, gave a comprehensive answer. But I think, you know, also make it fun because, you know, while, you know, training, yes, you need to do it at both, you know, your executive management level, there's your technical staff. But what about, you know, the organizations, you know, um, members? And we found, you know, when we kind of looked at, you know, capacity building, we split it into, you know, the three different, you know, um, end users. And I used to love, you know, the, what we used to call, um, you know, our smart awareness training, you know, within buildings. And that was just engaging, you know, the everyday person and telling them what can you do in your house and how can you bring that behavior back into the organization. And I think we often forget that, you know, they, you know, this is an ecosystem that you need to build. So that is just, you know, what I would add to what Marie and Abdullaya um, previously stated. Great job. Um, and just maybe 
before I look into the last question, and it's a it's a long and tricky one, and it's about South Africa. Um, I just wanted to ask if my colleague Sarah could share the results of our little um, could share the results of our little um, poll. So, um, Sarah, I think you could share your screen, and then we'll see. <laughs> people <laughs> that's really interesting i think we talked about this already um so if anyone still wants to um add something i think you have the ch the, the link in the chat um you can just like type in a word and then it will it will still grow um that's really interesting yeah um lack of information um uh issue saving so always put one word i think that's really important um great okay so i mean you're free to to add to that cloud. Um, and in the meantime, I think we have a question in the chat on um, which is quite long and it's from South Africa. So I'm just going to try to sum it up. So we have a, um, a colleague from a local municipality in South Africa and she's been trying since 2017 to get an energy efficiency project implemented. Um, but uh, one of the problems they face is a lack of re allocation of funding to other infrastructure projects deemed more urgent. Um, the project we are trying to implement is to develop a baseline assessment of our city hall with the intention to retrofit with energy efficient technologies in the following years. Oh, and it's a historic and heritage protected building. So that is a, <laughs> that is a very good question. Um, I'm sure this is, um, yeah, this is not an easy one to solve. Um, who has good advice um, for Karina? So I will start, but I'm open to Marie and Abdullaya to, um, you know, and add their perspective. So, you know, thank you for that question. Um, first of all, I haven't even shared with you some of the, 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 the tips and the tricks. My first suggestion, when I say create an ally, my question would be, which department are you in? And are you within the department that has, you know, that is managing that asset? And if the answer is no, my first bit of advice would be go and make friends in the department that manages that building. You will be surprised with, you know, how open some of one's colleagues are, but you really need to build that relationship. Um, because there's a number of ways um, that you can, you know, just at a, at a colleague level, at a more technical, you know, level, peer to peer, colleague to colleague, that you need to just, you know, do a little bit of legwork and, you know, awareness and just engagement that you need to do. And then my other question would be is, you know, ask the person who is managing that building, you know, like explain to them what is the intent, why do you need, you know, the electricity um, data, and that it, it, it is a complex process because if a building is being managed by a city, especially in the South African context, it's seen as, you know, it is just an internal cost. So you're going to find that getting access to that electricity bills, it's a complex process. So don't be thrown off if they tell you that they can't actually get access to it. So it's not that they don't want to give it to you. It's just, it's a technicality of how the data is collected inside of the municipality. And then I would say, if that is a dead end road, engage with electricity colleagues, tell them that this is the meters number, you know, help us to get access, you know, to, to, to that information. I would, I would say if it's just one building, start by looking at what are the resources and the people at hand that I can engage with and how much traction can I build at that one level. Then the second thing I would say is that facilities management department has got a maintenance and they also have access to stock items. Ask them next time when, 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 when lighting, when a light bulb blows, can you, you know, rather procure an energy efficient light bulb? So that does not mean, that does not need specific funds for the project, but you can tap into an existing mechanism and process to jumpstart, you know, the project. I mean, one thing is, is that I spent so much time to, you know, change all of the, the, the stock items in the city's, you know, um, maintenance departments and made sure that it was only energy efficiency items that was in place. And we got a shock when we looked at the data because departments were now only having access to energy efficiency light bulbs and energy efficiency, you know, fittings. 
And the next thing when we looked at the overall data is that we saw, you know, where the target of 10%, we ended up achieving over 15% in savings. And that was just because of tapping into, you know, the, the kind of stock items that was available to the rest of the departments. So I'm going to stop there because I think that, um, and I'm happy to take this conversation offline if you want to talk about some other strategies, but it is a very complex um, question that you've posed, so don't feel too bad if you, if you are still trying. It is a process. And maybe, I mean, for my other two speakers, and I think after this we have to wrap up, um, just because I think that question was also a question about conflicting priorities, no? Um, so basically, you know, what happens if, you know, why do other things always land on top? And how can you, you know, how can you make that issue a priority? Any good ideas? Um, just checking, who wants to start? Marie-Pierre? Abdoulaye, who, who wants to take that one? It's just really like, how do you convince yeah. people? Um, maybe one word, um, I think to raise the awareness of uh, the cities member, maybe we can try for the cities who are, which are engaged in the governance of Myers, maybe it could be a tool uh, to, to raise awareness of a, of a city's member, I think, because if the city is engaged in such a program, it shows that she's really, really willing to reduce its greenhouse uh, gas emissions. And I think it's also, Creating synergies between all the programs uh, conducted by the city is also a, a way um, to improve um, the different policies implementation and um, to better show that uh, building is energy efficiency in buildings and is part of a more global city sustainable policy. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I'm just, I'm getting um, messages from the organizers um, that we have four minutes until closing. And it's a lot easier to kick people out of a room when it's virtual <laughs> than when they're actually sitting there. So, um, Abdullah, if you have a really, really short answer to that question, um, the floor is yours. But <laughs> really um, lightning. Uh, I think uh, Marie Pierre and Sumaya has given has given the, the the right answer, so nothing really to add to that. So fine. <laughs> okay. uh, just for for me, which is very key, is to have always the engagement of the uh, the municipality, of the mayor, and the, for for a city from a city perspective, of course, for, for the mayor and the, the the municipal council, it's really important because what we have seen in the city of Dakar, we presented some results and. The mayor was was saying, "Wow, well, I didn't know that we have this possibility." Uh, and they asked us to come and, and present results to the municipal council. And from that time, it's written down somewhere. And every day or every month, uh, someone will ask how this project is going on. And I think it's very important. Mm, great. <laughs> I think this is a very good tactical point. So maybe also to our friend in South Africa. And um, once you have your building renovated, make sure that all the meetings that the mayor does are going to happen in that building and he knows about it. Um, okay, so um, so my challenge now is to quickly wrap up that very rich session. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank our speakers um, who brought their knowledge. I mean, I think um, you know them now. <laughs> so there's even an offer to take a um, discussion um, offline bilaterally. Um, Thank you very much for these rich presentations. Um, I think there will be, um, we will send an email to all participants with your presentations and also additional resources to follow up. Um, so, you know, keep in touch. We'll also send um, the, how you can sign up to the PEEP newsletter if you want to stay in touch. Um, and um, with that, I think my main takeaways were really um, on the one hand, um, you know, the solutions are there, you know, it's not that difficult to implement energy efficiency in buildings. It's also less costly than you think but you have to be smart about it, um, you know, and depending on your context, you really need to think about kind of what is a good way to actually capture these savings. No, it's not just you invest money, but it's really how you can capture these savings. Um, and what I found personally really interesting and fascinating was um, so that big question about data. 
Now, it's a bit of a geeky subject, but you really need the data to convince people. Um, and that leads me to the last point, people. I was surprised how much actually that issue popped up in everything that you said. It's about the people living in these buildings, but then it's also really about your colleagues, you know, maybe in the beginning, the opponents from the, you know, uh, from the facility management that you have to turn into allies, and then actually you can end up um, with really good results. With that, and at, you know, 29, <laughs> um, 20 seconds to close. Thanks everyone for